great to be back for another episode of Webinar Wednesday, talking about creating rock solid relationships and partnerships between education and industry. You know, not too long ago, in fact, last week, as a matter of fact, I took a little trip down memory lane and I got this photograph. I got this picture from one of my former business partners. He and I and a couple of other people own this business together up in Chilton, Wisconsin. And it was a company that did a ton of metal fabrication. So he was driving through the neighborhood and took a photo and just reminisced a little bit about our great time owning that business. It wasn't always easy, though, as you can imagine, in metal fabrication, finding great people was always a big challenge. And we hired and we employed a ton of welders, a ton of people working in welding booths, building fixtures for paint lines all over the United States. And those welders were really, really hard to find. So we went down every road that we could think of to find great talent. One of the things that we did was we tried to build a partnership with our local technical college, in this case, Lakeshore Technical College, uh, which is just on the eastern end of Wisconsin, near Sheboygan and Cleveland. If you're familiar with that area, awesome, awesome college uh, here in the state of Wisconsin. And that was our technical college, along with Fox Valley Technical College, when I ran that company in Chilton, Wisconsin. So I went and I visited with the program director of the welding program and we had a great meeting and he said, would you like to come in and present to our students about your company? And I said, absolutely. And so I did exactly that. I went and I visited that facility and I met with the students and talked about our great culture, how well we paid our people, our great benefits, what an awesome place to work that we were. And then I was really proud of myself. I got back in my car and I went back to my office and I waited for the resumes to roll in. And I waited and I waited and I waited for a day, a week, a month, several months. You know what I heard? That is what I heard. I heard crickets. I heard absolutely nothing from any of these students. And I was shocked. We ran a great company. Why wouldn't these students want to come work with us? And so I called that program director back and I said, you know, what gives? I, came and I gave this presentation to your students and we we're really proud of our company and not a single one of your students expressed interest in coming to us. And he, he kind of chuckled a little bit and he said, well, your presentation was really good, but you have to understand that for every one of our graduates, there are five jobs waiting for them out there. And there are things that employers do to put themselves at the front of the line when it comes to securing great talent. And he listed those out for me. He said they visit our facility not just once, but multiple times. They host plant tours for our students to come see their businesses. They know our college president and they know the deans of all the programs in our college. They know the program directors. They serve on our advisory boards and they don't just serve, but they actually attend the advisory board meetings. They serve on the board of the college, some of them, or on our foundation board. They sponsor scholarships for our students. They donate materials. They hire our students and pay them to complete their degrees while they are on their payroll and they help fund our curriculum and equipment. And he said, if you wanna to get to the front of the line, it's not anywhere near enough to just come and present to our students just once. And I learned a lot that day about the importance of building really, really good relationships with our, not just our technical and community colleges, but our universities, our high schools, our K-12 school districts. And we're gonna talk about today how you go about building those amazing relationships because it isn't rocket science, but there is a very specific list of things that the people that have great public-private relationships, great relationships with their technical colleges and their school districts are doing. And I wanna share some of those ideas. First, let's start with things that every single industrial employer, every single manufacturers should know about education. The first one is that our great tech ed teachers, our great CTE coordinators, principals, deans, program directors, instructors, they genuinely care as a rule about their students and their communities. And I can tell you, depending on who you listen to, depending on what you read, you may not always get that impression, but the truth of the matter is in working with these people across the state of Wisconsin, across the Midwest and across the United States, by and large, they have a genuine level of care for their community and for doing what's right. There's a bad apple in every single segment of our society and every job. It doesn't mean that every one of these folks is perfect, but the truth of the matter is as a general rule, they really, really care about their students, their employers, and their taxpayers and their communities. 
Number two, the second thing every industrial employer, every manufacturer must know about education, it is, it is not manufacturing. And if you expect your local educator to work and think and process and solve problems in the same way that you would as a manufacturer, you will be very, very disappointed. Because the truth of the matter is that education is a totally different world. And I've managed to learn that over the last five or six years of working in education after spending all those decades as a manufacturing CEO. It is different. It is not manufacturing. Some of the ways that it is different, you need to know that there are tons of stakeholders education. In manufacturing, sometimes we can just make a decision. The CEO, the president, somebody in a position of power just makes a decision and it makes it so. We can make a decision on Monday, implement on Wednesday, and see the results on Friday. Education does not work that way. We have to appease and win over teachers, administrators, like school districts, superintendents, like college presidents. We need to work closely with instructors, CTE coordinators, community members, other employers. There are all these stakeholders in your school district, in your local community college, in your local university. And we need to understand that we need to build relationships with all of them. We'll talk about that in a minute. On the education side, one of the things I was most amazed by when I came over from manufacturing is how many rules there are. We talked about this already. They can't just make a change. A lot of things have to go to school boards. A lot of things have to go all the way to the state in which that educator is operating. So it's not just as easy as making a decision and making a change. They have all these rules, all this bureaucratic red tape that they have to navigate. We can complain about it. We can say that as manufacturers, we would do it different, but that doesn't change the reality that getting things done in education isn't the same thing as getting things done in manufacturing. And so we can't do it exactly the same way. We have to understand how to navigate all that red tape, how to break down barriers, and be just a little bit patient as you work with your educator in doing so. The pace of education is different from the pace of manufacturing. It's not better or worse. It's not good or bad. It's just different. I remember telling a story about the first time they left me in the office after I came to the education world. And an instructor at a technical college called and said, we need a new gear for our mechanical drives trainer because of the gear broke. I panicked. In manufacturing, that's a line down. That is a serious situation. What? The manufacturing equipment isn't working. We need to get on this right away. And I said to the gentleman, I said, I don't know the answer to your question right now, but can I call you back by 10 o'clock? It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. The gentleman started laughing. He said, really, any time this month is fine. It's a different pace in education. Sometimes that's better. Sometimes that's worse. But you can't expect your local educator to move at the same pace that you're used to moving in manufacturing. It just doesn't work that way. It is tech ed, not shop class. When I served on the advisory board of one of the local high schools when I was in manufacturing, we would have all these industrial employers come in and talk about shop. Why? Because when they were in technical education 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, some of them, that's what they called it. It is not shop. Nobody in education calls it that. They don't have shop class. It's technical education. This is a good thing. Your manufacturing operation is way more technical, way more advanced than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, and education isn't any different. We are teaching technical education. We are teaching technical competencies. We're not teaching shop. So don't call it shop. Next thing, it is not about your equipment. Again, sitting on a lot of these advisory boards, we get these people that are really, really adamant that a high school program will put in this specific brand of a machining center with this specific tool uh, sitting in this specific spot. They want it to look exactly like what they are using. Now, the truth of the matter is we want students to use industrial equipment and many brands are more relevant than others. We'll get into that here. But the fact is that just because you have a certain brand of equipment sitting in your facility doesn't mean that that is what your educator, that is what your local school should be using. And you're gonna understand that and why that is here in just a moment. Part of the reason for that is that it is really about the curriculum. It's not about the equipment the student is learning on necessarily, although that can be important. It's more about the methodology of teaching what it is we're trying to teach on that equipment. And so as we think about it, the important thing is 
working with somebody that understands curriculum development, understands curriculum implementation. It's one thing to have your piece of equipment or something similar to that sitting in the school, that's fine. But that is only about 25% of the solution. The other 75% is the methodology for how we generate competencies and outcomes that are industrially relevant. And that is so much more than the equipment. It is all about the curriculum. It's all about the learning process and how we walk a student through that journey. Curriculum is really, really important. Another thing that is really important in education, and I didn't realize it until I got over to education from manufacturing, is certifications and third-party certifications are a huge trend in manufacturing. I'm sorry, a huge trend in education. So education is looking to industrial employers to ask what certifications are relevant as our students are going through these programs. A lot of that has to do with the way that CTE programs are funded. And if we can tie them to an independent third party industrially relevant certification, we can then secure grant funding for those programs. So learn about certifications, learn about which certifications are appropriate for the space in which you do business. Most of you know, I'm a huge fan of the Smart Automation Certification Alliance, not a coincidence that their certification is up here on this slide but you have to understand the value and the power and the importance of third-party certifications on the education side. And oh, by the way, they are becoming more and more important in the world of industry every day. Finally, and this is really, really important, solutions to train students for your jobs already exist. One of the most frustrating things I see from the outside, working with educators and working with industrial employers is where employers go in and they're really, really well intentioned and they want to do the right thing. And they say, we need to write curriculum around manufacturing competencies. That is crazy. The curriculum already exists. If you are a machining company and you need to implement a new machining center, do you go out and buy the sheet metal? Do you go out and buy the control? Do you go out and buy all the sensors and all the tooling and all the electric motors and put it together yourself? I bet not. I bet if you're a metal fabricator and you need a press brake, you're not building that press brake from scratch. Why? Because the technology already exists and you realize that your highest and best use, the best use of your time is to go ahead and utilize the technology that somebody else has already created to solve your problem, which is needing new equipment. Education works exactly the same way. For every competency you can think of, for every competency that exists in your manufacturing operation, there is already a curriculum and a methodology for teaching that competency. Learn what they are. Find the best in class solutions for teaching manufacturing technology and partner with your school district to implement the stuff that already exists. If there's opportunities for you to take that and make it better, go ahead and do that. But don't waste your resources and for goodness sake, don't waste the educator's time trying to invent the new way of teaching fill in the blank. There's people that have spent way more time on that than you ever could developing that. Believe it or not, to create one hour of curriculum in an education program takes 200 hours of investment, research and development, and curriculum writing. So if you're up to that task, have at it, but that is not your highest and best use. And so find those best-in-class solutions and put them to work in your educational institutions. Okay, so those are the things that every manufacturer should know about education. Now, how do we go about creating absolutely incredible relationships, rock solid relationships and partnerships with our educators? Number one, check the agenda at the door. I've spent my entire career in manufacturing up until five years ago. And I know, I like to think that I know how most manufacturers think. I think I know how they think about the government's role in their business, the government's role in their communities. And it's not always exactly the same, but by and large, there's kind of a consensus in the world of manufacturing from a political standpoint. And we can probably guess a little bit where most manufacturers lean. Now, we can say the same thing about educators and education. I spent a lot of time with world in the world of education. And there is certainly a wide variety of viewpoints, a lot wide variety of political philosophies in the world of education. But if we generalize, I think most of us probably have a pretty good feel for where many, if not most of the people in education land. And it's not always exactly the same spot or even close sometimes to where manufacturers land. It doesn't matter. 
check that agenda at the door. This is one of the best lessons that I learned from my friend Mike Bigley at Whitehall School District in Western Wisconsin when he built amazing industrial partnerships, way too amazing for us to go into in this discussion today. And he said, everybody has to check their agenda at the door. Whatever your philosophy, whatever your political, political hangups, who you like, who you don't like, who you complain about, who you say you love, it doesn't matter. This is about economic development. This is about growing the manufacturing base. This is about creating amazing experiences and pathways for students. What I like to say when I get in the room with people with differing views and political views in education is if you share my mission to secure the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent, your political ideologies make no difference to me. Let us find out ways that we can work together to move the needle forward for the benefit of our communities, for the benefit of our economy, for the benefit of our manufacturers, and for the benefit of our students. Number one, check your agenda at the door. Number two, build really, really good relationships. This is the example that I was set for me by that program director at the local technical college, that in order to be able to work really closely with your educators, to have access to their students, to help influence their curriculum and their programs, it all starts with amazing relationships. These are the people that you should know if you're working with your educator be it a community college or a local school district. So let's start with the community or technical college. Every single technical college has somebody at the top of the food chain. Every, usually it's called a president, sometimes it's called a CEO, sometimes it's called a president and CEO, but everybody has a person in that position. Do you know the name of your president and CEO of your local community college? Have you met that person? Do they know your name? If I mentioned your company to them, would they know who you are? They should. These are the people that are producing the next generation of talent for your organization. You rely on them heavily, heavily, and you should know who they are. You should also know the vice president of the technical or community college, and sometimes there are many. They may have a vice president of academic affairs. They might have a vice president of development. They might have a vice president of workforce, and you should know those folks as well. They're great committed people, almost all of them, working in your local community, their community members themselves. You should really know the vice presidents at your community college. Next to the, to the vice presidents and the next level in the organization are typically deans. And so you've got a dean of every program and oftentimes multiple programs. In other words, you may have a welding program at your local college and you have a CNC program and you have an electromechanical technology program and an industrial maintenance program and an automotive technology program. And a lot of times deans will be responsible for multiple programs within the college. So whatever program or programs your particular competencies fit into, you should know the deans of those programs. You should know them on a first name basis. They should know you, you should be working with directly with them. There's a program director for every program. So if we think about a dean that has a responsibility for electromechanical technology, CNC, and welding, the welding program itself will have an individual who is responsible for that program. Usually it's somebody just above an instructor level, probably an instructor themselves, who works in the program and oversees that specific program. And finally, we have hundreds of thousands of amazing instructors. This is what we call a teacher at a community college or a technical college. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but an instructor at a technical or community, many of them don't have significant formal training in teaching. Unlike somebody at a university or somebody in a high school school district, they probably didn't go to school for education. Really, really good chance that they did not. They came out of industry. There are people just like you and me who worked a career in industry and decided to do something a little bit different, or maybe they're continuing to work in industry and they're an adjunct instructor in a program. These people are amazing. They know technology, they know their students, and you should know them, and you should build great relationships with them. These are the people that are going to connect you directly to the students as you're recruiting them. So that's what it looks like on a technical and community college basis. University is somewhat similar, although the president CEO may be called a chancellor. The vice president, uh, in terms of academics, is usually called the provost. And then you have deans, program directors, and in that case, professors. And the program directors in a university are often called a program chair. All right, now let's talk about our local school districts. Every one of them, or just about every one of them, has a superintendent. Sometimes this is called a district administrator. 
Uh, this is an individual that oversees the school district for the entire community. And so they're responsible typically for every public school in a community in a municipality. So if your school district has a superintendent, you should know who that superintendent is. They have CTE coordinators at the district level as well. So typically these are people that are responsible for continuing, I'm sorry, for technical education, career technical education across the entire district, across multiple schools, a middle school, maybe several middle schools, a high school, maybe several high schools. But these are the people that have tremendous influence in the world of education at the K-12 level over the curriculum, the competencies and the programs in the world of career technical education. You should know your local career technical coordinator. Principal, everybody knows what this is, right? Your high school had a principal, your middle school had a principal, know that principal. Now, a lot of times they'll be more uh, adept and more knowledgeable in certain areas than others, depending upon what part of the school they came up with. A lot of them will delegate some of the decisions about career technical education to other people, either upwards into the district or down toward their teachers, but you should know the principals in every single one of your schools that teach anything related to what you're doing, whether it's a high school program that is teaching uh, something specific to your particular area of industry or a middle school te program teaching pre-engineering, teaching STEM, you should know who those folks are. And then your CTE teachers. Now this is in the old days, which you called your shop teacher, but these people are incredible. CTE teachers in our high schools, in our middle schools, are amazing. They're, they're jacks of all trades. One day they're teaching welding, the next day they're teaching automotive technology, the next day they're teaching manual machining, the next day they may be teaching blueprint reading. They are incredibly knowledgeable, they are incredibly effective at building great relationships with their students, and you should know every single one of these people. So the second step is to build amazing relationships. Know the structure within a community college, a technical college, your local school district, your local university and engineering program, you should know those people backwards and forwards. You should have first name personal relationships with the people in these programs. Number three, admit that you don't speak the same language. I'm always kind of curious when we sit down in a meeting with educators in one side of the room and industrial employers on the other side and they start talking, they're almost afraid to say the wrong thing. They're almost afraid to call something something that it isn't. Some of you have heard my story about PLCs and I was in front of a group of educators and I was telling them about how PLCs are so incredibly valuable in the world of manufacturing. PLCs are the computer of manufacturing. We're taking inputs from sensors and, and probes and, and all other kinds of inputs for a manufacturing operation and taking that information and we are creating an output. We're changing the temperature of something. We're activating a switch. We're activating an actuator. And so I was talking all about how important PLCs were in manufacturing. And it was clear that I wasn't quite resonating with the audience. Well, in the world of manufacturing, a PLC is a programmable logic controller. In the world of education, it is a professional learning community. Two totally different things. So I was using this word that meant one thing to my audience and another thing to me as a manufacturer. Sometimes we have words in manufacturing that don't have corresponding words in the world of education and vice versa. And so realize right up front and admit right up front that you don't speak each other's languages, that you're gonna use words that the others may not understand or may not be familiar with, that it's okay to say, you know what? That's really, really interesting but I don't have any idea what that means. Can you explain it to me? And that's true for both sides of the table because there is a whole language in education, believe me, and a whole separate set of like letters that come together and mean something that I tried to try to figure out when I came over to the world of education that exist in one world or the other. And you really need to admit that you don't speak each other's language and that it's okay to ask questions and to lower the defenses. And it's also, by the way, okay to say the wrong thing or call something the wrong thing. And it's okay to correct somebody if they call it the wrong thing. That is how we build trust. That's how we build relationships. But don't be afraid to speak up and recognize that just because you call things different things or aren't familiar with the vernacular of the people on the other side of the table, you can still create great relationships and create amazing outcomes. All right, number four, ask to serve on their boards. These are the people that really have influence in the world of education. So every single college has a college board of directors or something similar to that. These are people that are not paid. 
They're from the community. They represent a number of different constituencies within the community. Some are ex officio seats that are basically held for the head of economic development or held for a mayor of a community or something like that. And others are at large seats, people that are elected to that board from the outside that represent the community, that represent outside interests. And every single college has a board like this. And if you can work it out to where you are serving on that board, and obviously you have to be selfless, you can't act in your own self-interest, but it is an amazing way to build incredible relationships, not just with the leadership of the college, but with other people who are influencing the program, influencing the curriculum. Every single community has some version of a school board. And there's certainly nothing wrong with running for your school board or at a minimum getting to know who your school board representatives are. And so when you want to share an idea, when you think something could be done a little bit differently, that is a great venue for you to share information. So serve on your school board, run for your school board, support local people that are serving on that school board and build relationships with them. Every college or at least most of them have a separate foundation. This is a separate nonprofit organization that basically becomes the trust of gifts that are given to the college. So most of the time when somebody gives a gift to the college, they're not giving it directly to the college. They will give it to the foundation that supports the college. And there is a foundation board that is responsible, has a fiduciary responsibility for protecting the value within the foundation and for allocating funds within the college to the areas where they will do the most good, always in consistency with what the intentions of the gift were when an individual made that donation, made that gift to the foundation. So it's a great opportunity. I serve on a foundation board at a, at a technical college. It is awesome. What you learn, what you see, the relationships that you build, really, really important. And then when it comes to your community and technical colleges, if you or a member of your team is not serving on the advisory board that relates to the program for the students that you are hiring, I don't want to hear from you about not being able to build a great relationship with your college. These are the people who absolutely determine what is taught, how it is taught, by whom, in what way. They communicate the function that is taking place in private enterprise, the things that are taking place in your business, the trends that you're seeing in your world of manufacturing, the challenges that you're seeing in hiring and maintaining an amazing workforce. And these boards provide tremendous value to the program. I can tell you in working with college deans and working with program directors, almost any time I go in and suggest that they think about doing something a little bit differently, the very first thing they'll do is point to their advisory board and say, we do what our advisory board tells us we should be doing based upon what they are seeing in manufacturing and what they think about our programs. This is one of the uniquely amazing things about technical education at the technical and community college level is how much influence local employers have over those programs. But only if you're there, only if you're at the table and it's not good enough to just put your name on the list, you have to go to the meetings. Most of them are twice a year and they last about an hour and a half. And oh, by the way, they give you a pizza to eat while you're sitting in the meeting. And it is amazing what you learn from other employers, what you learn about your community college and how much influence you can have over what and how is being taught in your local community or technical college and the program that relates to your business. All right, so those are the first four. The final one is offer your resources. Now, sometimes employers get a little bit scared when the college or the school district shows up with their handout asking for money. And we tell school districts and we tell colleges, ask for help, not money. Don't go to your local employers begging for cash. Go to them begging for advice. Go to them begging for input. And if they believe strongly in what you're doing, the cash will come. But I can tell you when we talk to industrial employers, one of the greatest ways to build amazing relationships is to help them fund curriculum and equipment acquisition. Now, here's a warning and a caveat to that. The last thing I want to see any industrial employer do is take some piece of equipment that's past its prime that you've been using for 10 years that isn't being used at full capacity for whatever reason you don't need it anymore and pick it up and give it to your community college. They may say thank you, but trust me, they don't want it any more than you did. And there's no value in teaching a student on technology that's 10 years old. And so keep those donations to yourself. And they may make you feel good, but they don't do anybody any good. Talk to the college, talk to the school district about what they're trying to teach, how they're trying to teach it, 
find a great partner on the outside that can provide a learning system, not just a piece of equipment. Learning system means curriculum, it means e-learning, it means equipment that has been designed to deliver the outcomes and the competencies that are being sought. And so help fund curriculum and equipment. And that's a great thing to do, but just putting your money where your mouth is, isn't the only thing that you can do. And that's why at the top of the slide, we use the word resources, not money. Because the truth of the matter is other things you can do is to lobby your school board members and legislators. Now, when I say lobby, I put that in quotes. It's not like you're hiring a formal lobbyist necessarily. It's not like you have to take a big trip to Washington DC twice a year, but as you're building relationships with your local school board members, as you're building relationships with your federal senators, with your Congress people, with your state uh, level assembly people, legislators, Senate, however your state is set up, is you're building relationships with those people. Don't be afraid to tell them how important it is to provide the right kind of funding for the right kind of initiatives. It's not just enough to throw money at a problem, but we, if we have programs that are specifically designed to train a student for competencies that are important in your world of work, please share that with your school board members, please share that with your government officials because they can drive capital and investment back toward the kinds of things that will benefit you, benefit your company, and most important, benefit your students in your community. Advise them on their curriculum. We tell them to ask for help, not money. You should offer help. Offer to spend time with them. Offer to them to review current programs. Offer to show them what it is that you're doing in your manufacturing operation and how your technology is changing so that they understand how their technology should be changed. So that's not putting money where something is, that is advising and offering your time. Same for hosting plant visits. This is a great way to familiarize students with manufacturing technology. Now, if your plant is still one of those that's maybe a little dingy, isn't clean, isn't well lit, you don't have the ceilings painted white, it doesn't look like the kind of place you would want your kid to work, don't bring somebody else's kid in there and try, to, try and convince them that that's their job or that that's where they should be working. But if you have one of the hundreds of thousands of world-class plants that exist across the United States that may even be air conditioned, that are clean, that are modern, that are comfortable, and you can bring students into that environment and show them what industry 4.0 manufacturing, what advanced manufacturing looks like, in the year 2021, please open up the doors to your facility and invite the students in so they know how amazing a career in manufacturing can be. Sponsor scholarships. So this is, this is a great opportunity. Uh, you do it through the college's foundation. You can be really, really specific about the types of scholarships, the types of students in terms of um, what programs they're in. You can be specific in terms of how they qualify for the scholarship based on uh, things like what kind of grades they're earning, what kind of classes that they're taking. But you can sponsor a scholarship toward a specific student. And I've done several of these, and I can tell you it's one of the most rewarding things that you do in the community and technical college world, where a specific student is awarded a scholarship that you funded or helped to fund. That is incredibly rewarding. And believe me, they never forget it. Attend college events. So your college is having golf outings, your college is having open houses, colleges are having um, continuing professional education events where you can learn about new technology, learn about things that are going on in education, follow them on social media, pay attention to their website. And when you see an event that looks interesting, go. I can tell you sometimes the groups are, for these are much smaller than they should be and you can get access to students and access to faculty and administrators in a, in a really, really efficient fashion because they're all there. So as your college is having events, as they're having uh, dinners, silent auctions, uh, they all do this kind of stuff. Get involved at that level. It's really, really valuable. <clears throat> Consider foundation support. Like we said, every college has a foundation and you can support the foundation directly. You can support it with your cash through a restricted or unrestricted gift. You can support it with the gift of equipment. Again, as long as it's something that applies to specific curriculum that's already been developed, so we're not reinventing the wheel, consider supporting the college's foundation. So those are the five steps to incredible relationships with educators. Check your political agenda at the door. Nobody cares what your politics are, and the truth of the matter is they don't matter if we're trying to help kids and we're trying to uh, inspire people toward amazing careers. So recognize that you're gonna have a political agenda, so are your educators, maybe they're the same, they're probably different, it doesn't matter. Don't get hung up on that stuff. Talk about how you can help students, talk about how you can help your community, 
talk about how you can secure the American dream for the next generation of STEM and workforce talent. Build great relationships at every level of your community college, at every level of your school district, and for that matter, at every level of your relevant universities. You should know these people, presidents, superintendents, principals, vice presidents, deans, program directors, instructors, teachers, you should know them by name and they should know exactly who you are. Recognize when you have conversations with them that you're not gonna speak the right language in the same language and that's okay. Let your guard down, be vulnerable, tell them I may say some things that you don't understand, please ask me if I do and you're gonna say some things that I'm not gonna understand and I'm gonna ask you to help me out with that when you do. This is all about understanding each other and driving things forward for the right reasons. Ask to join their boards, college boards, advisory boards, school boards, great opportunities for you to build awesome relationships with your educational partners. And finally, offer your resources and that's not just your cash and it's not just your equipment. Oftentimes it is your valuable time in service to the college and service to the school district so you can share great ideas with them. So with that, Melissa, I hope this was helpful to all of our industrial employers that are on with us today and I will invite questions from the audience. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And I think we just have one question, which I think is a great question. And that, as you mentioned, technical and community colleges, quite often, does this apply to universities as well? It does. Yeah, great question. So universities are a little bit different. And usually when we're talking to manufacturers, not always, but usually when they're trying to build a great relationship on the STEM side, on the technical side, I'm not talking about recruiting marketing people, accountants and and uh, people for those types of roles. Certainly that's important too, but it's kind of outside the purview of this discussion. We're usually talking about their engineering programs, mechanical engineering, um, manufacturing engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering that relate directly to the work that the manufacturer is doing. And so all of those best practices absolutely apply. Some of the people, as we suggested in the webinar, uh, may have a little bit different title. I'm a chancellor instead of a president. Sometimes I'll have a chancellor and a president. Um, so the titles might be a little bit different, but the methodology and strategies are very similar. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa. And uh, thanks, everybody, for being with us. A great discussion about creating amazing industrial and education partnerships. Went a little long this week, but we had a lot to share with you. And we will be back next week. As you know, if you're a regular attendee, we are here every single Wednesday at 2 o'clock Central. Hope to see you again.